Oh 
praising my Savior all the day long. Well, hopefully you were able to sing along with that great hymn this morning. Uh, wherever you are, uh, those great lyrics are songs of praise. Uh, let me say again, just how thankful I am uh, for your faithfulness in giving God's tithes and your offerings. I say God's tithes because we believe that the Bible teaches a tithe belongs to the Lord. That's His. And uh, someone asked the question one time, how shall a man rob God? Well, and then the answer comes right back. We rob God by withholding His tithes and our offerings. Yes, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And out of our abundance or out of what we have, we are to return back a portion of that to the Lord. I hear people pray sometimes, well, Lord bless those who can give and those who can't. Well, friends, that's not even a, a biblical prayer because we can all give. We can all give from what we have. And the Lord set that up, uh, not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. And I'm just so thankful for the faithfulness of our church through this time. It is a sign of a healthy congregation. Crisis cannot stop the cross. When the future is uncertain, we do not lean on our own understanding. For He is our ever-present help in times of trouble. Though the earth may tremble and the mountains fall into the sea, we do not fear, because He is the rock of our salvation. And when crisis knocks at our door and the things of earth are like dust in the wind, we stand firm, believing in the promise that we rest safely in His hands. For this is why He came, why He lived, and why He died, that we might have life and have it more abundantly, and take comfort in the knowledge that He is our King. Because we know that when all seemed lost and death thought it had won, crisis could not stop the cross. If you'll take your copy of God's Word, our scripture reading for today will come from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 will be the basis of our message this morning in just a few moments after Kay comes to sing again. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cratians to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. And somewhere in that list is a Benedict Arnold. We're going to talk about it in a little while.
I'm sure that most uh, have heard of Benedict Arnold. You've heard of him. He was an American-born senior officer of the British Army who commanded the American Legion in the later part of the American Revolutionary War. He is best known for his desertion from the Continental Army to the British side of the conflict in the year 1780. Now, boy, that's a noble thing to be remembered for, isn't it? A quitter, a deserter, a defector. You know, the word deserter is defined as abandon, a person, cause, or organization in a way that is considered disloyal and treacherous. Well, Paul had a Benedict Arnold. Now, I say the work of God is probably filled with Benedict Arnold's. Scholars tell us that our text this morning that we have read from 2 Timothy chapter 4 was written from the Mamertine prison in Rome. Paul was in a cell, a prison cell, a dark and dingy, damp dungeon of a cell. And as he is in there, coming toward the end of his life as he knows it, Paul knows that these are his last days. And as he stays in that prison cell and he begins to ponder over his life, he remembers a man named Demas. You know, Paul never had a more promising associate than Demas. Demas was a young man. He was aggressive. He was enthusiastic. And I mean, we've all seen those kind, haven't we? On fire for the Lord with the word of God burning deep in their heart. Perhaps Paul had wondered if maybe Demas would take over the evangelistic enterprise, that Demas might be the one to take over Paul's ministry. But somewhere, somewhere along the way, something went terribly wrong. The grip of the world wrapped its tentacles around the heart and the mind of Demas. The fire in Demas turned to ashes. His dreams turned to disappointments. Now it's only what might have been. Now listen, 
Some would say, well, now, preacher, Demas made a mistake. Uh, he wasn't really called to the ministry. He made a mistake. Uh, or we may say, well, you know, I don't know if that person was ever really saved or not. Others would pine away, well, Demas probably got hurt. Somebody probably hurt his feelings. Somebody probably did this or somebody probably did that and Demas got hurt. Well, listen to me. Who hadn't been hurt? But that's no reason to quit just because you've been hurt. You say, well, you don't know how I've been. Listen, I've been hurt, all right, in the Lord's work, doing the work of the ministry. I've been hurt. I've been undermined. I've been talked about. I've been cussed on Facebook. But listen, you have to keep going in the work of the Lord. Still others would say, well, he just wanted to do ministry a little bit. But perhaps the Bible would call him a backslider. Now there's an old term for you, isn't it? Yeah, we don't hear much about that anymore. But a backslider is in the Bible. And the word backslider means that you have slid back from a previously held position. And it's a, it's a slide. It's not a jump or a fall, but it's back slid. But in our text, Paul uses even stronger language than that. In verse 10 of our text, Paul says about Demas, Demas hath forsaken me. Now think about that word, forsaken. Friend, that means deserted. And in forsaking Paul, Demas was also forsaking all that Paul stood for. All that Paul had been preaching. The gospel, Jesus the work of the ministry. And it's interesting to me as I was studying this passage, I'm, I love biographies of people. I love to study people in the Bible uh, because we can learn so much from them and some we never hear about. But uh, I've heard many sermons in this, about this man's life, Demas, and I looked up a number of uh, commentaries and such on the life of Demas. And it was interesting what some preachers have uh, titled a sermon or a lesson or a treaty on the life of Demas. One named it, Demas, why did you quit? Another title was a backslider in heart. Another title was the curious case of Demas. And here was an interesting one, a costly love affair with the world. Here's another one, spiritual adultery at its brightest. And then one uh, called his message, Jesus had his Judas and Paul had his Demas. That tells us a lot about this situation. So at the end of the aged apostle's life, he sums up Demas as being a deserter. So we talked this morning about Demas, the deserter. I mean, can anything worse be said about a person? I mean, think about Benedict Arnold. That's all, I don't know a thing else about Benedict Arnold other than he was a quitter, other than he was a traitor, other than he was a deserter. I mean, have you ever been forsaken or deserted, maybe in a marriage, maybe in a friendship, maybe deserters in the military. But ladies and gentlemen, we all need to be cautious. We all need to be on alert, lest we desert the Lord too. You see, Paul, as you study his life, I think he was rather obsessed with this on another level. If you read about the life of the Apostle Paul, I think you'll find that he had an obsession with this idea of disqualification. He talked about being a castaway. He talked about not finishing the race well. That was on Paul's mind. 
And from a study of Scripture, we can see three stages this morning in the life of Demas, the deserter. And I want to touch upon these for just a moment in the time we have today. I want us to look at a stage of devotion, a stage of decision, and a stage of desertion. So, number one, the stage of devotion. Now, I want you to get this because you may be saying, oh, I'm on fire for Jesus. There's no way I'm going to desert the Lord. Let me tell you something. These pews have been full at one time or another of people who were on fire and couldn't say amen loud enough and somewhere along the way they turned their back and deserted the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it can happen to one of Paul's closest cohorts in the ministry, ladies and gentlemen, it can happen to any of us. The stage of devotion. This sordid sentence of verse 10 refers to a present failure in Demas' life, but it also implies a past faithfulness. To see the first stage, we go back six or seven years to the book of Philemon. In Philemon, verse 24, back to different and better times. In the book of Philemon, uh, verse 24, the Bible says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Now, notice in Philemon that Demas is called a fellow laborer. Now, this is important. Fellow laborer means to work with. You see, Paul and Demas work together in the work of God. Now, uh, Paul didn't just choose anybody. Wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, don't you imagine that Paul had high standards? Uh, the bar was high and he went after the spiritual Marines, maybe the healthiest and hardiest and holy of men to make up this battalion of mighty men. Paul and Demas working together. They were together in duty. They preached together, Paul in the synagogue, maybe Demas on the street corner. Demas was Paul's front man from city to city. They preached together, they planted together. I mean, they were itinerant preachers. Paul was a missionary, planting churches everywhere he went. Paul would plant, Demas would water, Paul would hold the nail, Demas would swing the hammer. Oh, how they planted together. I'll tell you something else they did. They prayed together. Two spiritual giants in a supernatural pod. Paul and Demas. Paul was a man of very spiritual praying. You can study God's word and you'll find in the prayers of Paul. I don't remember Paul necessarily praying about a broke toe. Although... If your toe is broke, you probably want somebody to pray for it. But when you look at the prayer life of the Apostle Paul and you put it up against a lot of the prayers that we hear prayed today, there would be a disconnect. See, Paul was all about praying that people would grow in the Lord. Read his prayers. Read the one in Colossians where he wanted and prayed for those people to grow spiritually. And Paul was a great prayer warrior. But he prayed not about broken toes, but he prayed about broken lives. You can read his prayers. And I believe that because Demas was so close as a fellow laborer to Paul, that no doubt Paul taught him how to be a prayer warrior. Even the disciples, when they came to the Lord, They could have said, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to build a church. But no, what they said was, Lord, teach us to pray. I'll tell you, prayer is important in the life of the child of God. And prayer by his own admission, page after page, was important to the Apostle Paul. And I believe that Paul and Demas preached together. They planted together and they prayed together together in duty. But also I believe that Paul and Demas were together in doctrine. 
What does that mean? Well, that means that they studied the Word of God together. And I'll tell you, Paul, I mean, he wrote uh, so much of the New Testament by the inspiration of God. So no doubt he knew what it meant. And I believe that he poured himself into Demas. And I believe there was a time when Demas was just like his teacher. He was with him together in doctrine. Paul had taught Demas. And they believed that the Bible was the Word of God. They believed in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. They believed that whosoever will may come and trust the Lord as Savior. And listen, they believe that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of the living God. And I'll tell you, if they hadn't believed the same, if Demas had not believed as Paul did, I believe Paul would have cut him loose. Paul was, would be what we would call a modern-day fundamentalist. He preached hell hot and heaven sweet, and sin black, and judgment sure, and Jesus saves. See, Demas and Paul were together in doctrine. Let me tell you something else. They were together in danger. Paul and Demas had both felt the cold steel of a prison bar. They'd both been singed by the fires of persecution, the gnawing pains of poverty, Staring into the eyes of death, hand to hand, head to head, heart to heart. What a lesson it is for all of us. Demas stood on the mountaintop, on the spiritual mountaintop with that glorious apostle Paul. But yet somewhere along the way, he slid into the valley of worldliness. And friend, it could happen to any of us. Don't think it can't. Listen, there was a stage of devotion in Demas' life. We're not talking about just some Johnny come lately. But he, he and Paul were just like this. But secondly, we move from the stage of devotion to the stage of decision. This happens a few months after what we read in Philemon 24. A few months has passed. Remember, he was a fellow laborer. Now, a few months has passed. And Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14 tells the tale. Colossians 4, 14 says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Did you see it? Paul referred to Luke as the beloved physician. And he no longer says Demas the fellow laborer. He just says Demas. Perhaps Paul had sensed a change going on in Demas' life. You know, I've seen that long before someone walks away from the Lord and, of course, spending all of these many years in youth ministry, I've watched it time after time after time. When young people would be on the firing line for Jesus, their hearts would be on fire for the Lord, and then somewhere along the way, maybe they started running with another crowd. Maybe they... Some boy started dating a certain girl or a girl started dating a certain boy. And I could see the beginning of the fires of the Lord begin to cool. Those who once went on mission ventures, those who once served the Lord, those who once you could always count on, something along the way turned them from the Lord. You know, I think God gives our spiritual leaders, the gift of discernment or intuition, as some may call it. Uh, and I believe that Paul had that regarding Demas. Perhaps Paul saw some things in the life of Demas. Maybe his zeal began to falter. Maybe his enthusiasm for the things of God began to wax cold. Well, if in his chariot or whatever he rode, they had a radio, maybe he used to listen to Christian music. 
Uh, maybe the folks he's been hanging out with, they don't listen to that. That's, that's for prudes. So let's get it over here on this other station that fills our minds and fills our hearts with the pervertedness of the world. Oh, friend, everything brings with it something. Listen, maybe he was no longer having a hot love for the Word of God. Used to, when he would come to the house of God, he wanted to sit up close in front and center. He wanted to have his Bible open. He wanted to take a note. He wanted to know all that Paul was preaching and all that the Lord had. But now, oh, he, if he even comes, he, he doesn't bring his Bible, doesn't know where it is. No longer has that daily quiet time that he used to have. I'll tell you, friend, once you stop having your daily quiet time, that's the first sign of trouble. I say that because Adam and Eve in the garden, they used to walk with the Lord in the cool of the day. But somewhere along the way, after they ate that fruit, they evidently didn't show up because a little bit later, the Bible says that God had to go looking for them. They didn't show up. See, when you don't show up to your daily quiet time with the Lord, that's number one, that something's wrong. Maybe something else happened. We don't know, but something happened in the life of Demas. This change did not happen overnight. He was not out working for God one day and then snap. No, sir. Backsliding does not happen overnight, but it happens one step at a time. In Proverbs 14, 14, the Bible says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. See, it always begins in the heart, and it always means we are filled with something. And it's always selfish. It's always a self-centered, self-serving purpose. A little of this and a little of that. Demas began to hear the call of the world. <laughs> and Demas wanted to know more about the call of the world. To drink more of its drink. To see more of its women. To learn more of its ways. Listen, the sad thing is Demas knew. Listen, Demas knew in his heart and in his mind that he could not serve two masters. And friend, you know that too. You know, the Greeks, they had a game. And uh, uh, this is pretty amazing to me, but uh, they, they'd put two horses together. And here are the two horses. I can't even illustrate this for you today, but they'd put two horses together and the rider of the horse would put this leg over on this horse and he would put the other leg over the other horse. You got the mental picture here? Straddling a horse. And he would stay on the horses and they would send the horses going down the road. <laughs> and at some point, the horses would split in two directions. And in that split second, the rider had to make a choice. Am I going this way or am I going that way? Well, you see, Demas was in a stage of decision where once he would only look at the trinkets of the world, now he looks twice. The pull of the world is getting harder. And friend, whenever you begin to look twice, you're headed down a bad road. No one can serve two masters. The Bible says he will end up hating one and loving the other. Now listen, that is a strong picture. But the Bible says that if you try to serve two masters, if you try to serve God and you try to serve the world, the Bible says you will end up hating one and loving the other. And after all these years, in church work, 
Do you know who I think gets hated the most in that little scenario? Most of the time, it's the Lord who gets hated. And it is the world who gets embraced. Because there's something about a person fiddling with the trinkets of the world. His mind, his heart has already been turned just a little bit. Make no mistake, God's Word is true. The pull of the world is getting harder for Demas. Listen, at first, in the life of Demas, it was all, listen now, it was all Jesus and no world. Hey, now that made Demas a dull boy. Then it became mostly Jesus and partly the world. Then it became partly Jesus and mostly world. And then it became none of Jesus and all the world. When the world moves in, it moves God out. Listen, you cannot be full of the world and there be any room for Jesus. You are full of something. You ever been told that you're full of something? Yeah. Well, you're full of something. You're either full of Jesus or full of the world or part full of this and part full of that. But you make that decision for your own life. Listen, it came down to a decision. And what we are today is because of decisions we made yesterday. And what we are tomorrow is because of decisions that we will make today. I'll tell you, Demas' future was decided by a faulty decision. I've seen many people whose lives have been forever altered because of a faultly decision. Listen, perhaps Demas used to sing I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Now he had a new song. I had decided to follow Jesus. But now I'm going to turn back. We see his devotion all right. We see a battle going on in his mind, and it is a battle many times. Because I believe that deep down in every true believer resides the Holy Spirit of God. You got him when you got saved. Now, some people will tell you, well, you got to get him again, or you got to get this blessing, or you got to get that. No, listen, li li listen. When you got saved, you got all of the Holy Spirit you ever going to get. The question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? But I believe that if a person is truly born again, now you listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. I believe that if a person is truly born again, that when the devil puts that first trinket in front of you and you take that first long lingering look, I believe a bell goes off in your heart. It's the Holy Spirit saying, watch out now. Watch out, you're getting, you're getting too close <laughs> to the enemy. And let me tell you something, some of you, by the way you live your life, now watch this, at the edge of this stage, some of you try to live just as close to the edge as you can get and not sin. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. The closer to the edge you live your life, the quicker it's going to be for the devil or one of his demons from hell to walk by you and push you off. Listen, you need to, lead, to live your life as close to the Lord as you possibly can. 
Don't try to travel on the edge of the cliff. Oh, we see devotion and we see decision. But lastly this morning, we see desertion. When the bell of the Holy Spirit went off in Demas' life, he just pushed it away. And he went on about his business. So we see the stage of desertion. Demas, after his decision, which came after his devotion, Demas did not lose his salvation on this day, but he had lost his satisfaction. Paul said, Demas went to Thessalonica having loved this present world more. You see, you can tell a lot about a person by what it takes to satisfy them. I think you can tell a lot about a person by what it takes to make them laugh. You know, if, if, if there's some perversions or something going on and you're laughing about it, that, that tells more about you than it, it does the one telling the tale. You can learn a lot by what satisfies a person. Some who used to be satisfied with the things of God now have given over much ground to other things. I believe that Demas was a saved man, but he was a true backslider. He was a deserter. He was disobedient. He was an ineffective Christian. He lost his joy because he had moved away from the Lord. And the Bible says, in thy presence, O Lord, is fullness of joy. You meet a person who has no joy, and there is a person who does not live their life in the presence of the Lord. The fire had gone out. And I want you to notice what took place in this stage of desertion. Number one, he, he loved the world. Did you see that in verse 10? For Demas hath forsaken me. Now, maybe you wonder, well, why did he forsake Paul? Hey, maybe Paul could tell you were going to ask that question. So he goes ahead and tells you why. You don't have to wonder why Demas did what he did. Paul said, having loved this present world and is departed to Thessalonica. You don't have to wonder why Demas deserted Paul. Paul tells us he loved the world. And friends, that is no, no insignificant condemnation. He's not talking about the world of nature. He's not talking about the world of men, but he is talking about the world system, the way the world thinks, the way the world prioritizes, the way the world is. People who live by the world's values, willingly serve its ends. To compare all of this thinking to 1 John, Paul was saying that Demas had become an enemy of God. Now that's one thing, not to have any use for God. It's an entirely different thing to be categorized by the word of God as being an enemy of God. And friend, I'll tell you, if you want to be an enemy of anybody, you don't want to be an enemy of God. But you can be. I mean, what was it with Demas? Listen, was it the lust of the flesh? Was it the lust of the eyes that got him? Was it the pride of life that got him? John Phillips, a commentator, wonders, was it an unsaved woman that got him? Was it the fear of man? Maybe in his case, was it a safer pulpit? Maybe Paul was too rigid, too fanatical. Maybe Demas' wife was a, a social climber and had already departed for Thessalonica. Hey, maybe, maybe, De watch this now. Maybe Demas had kids and he decided he didn't want to raise his kids going from place to place, doing all this itinerant preaching. And he wanted to put his kids over here and he wanted to put his kids over there. Listen, I've seen many parents 
more concerned about the temporal, about getting that scholarship, about getting the social status of their kids uh, to the demise of their spiritual life. I'll tell you, there's a guy in the Bible by the name of Lot. And you study that that thing out, buddy, and Lot was more concerned about his cows than he was about his kids. If he had not been so worried about his cows and had more concern about his kids, maybe he would have not chosen the well-watered plains of Sodom. I don't know. Some pursuits. I'll tell you, parents can push your kids so. I've seen kids on fire for the Lord and other people come in planting ideas in their mind and before the end of the day, they had turned their back on the Lord never to be seen again. We do know that Demas joined the company of people like Lot and Absalom and Orpah, I started to say Ophrah, Solomon and Jonah. John tells us exactly, ladies and gentlemen, what it means to love the world. John tells us that in 1 John 2. The Bible says in verse 15 and 16, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Listen, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen now, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but it is of the world. Demas was in love with the world. We call that spiritual adultery. That means giving your love spiritually to anyone other than Jesus Christ. It means that you are guilty of spiritual adultery. adultery. Now listen, we might get all worked up, and, and we do, about people that commit adultery. But, but ladies and gentlemen, Baptist churches all across America are filled with people who may not be guilty of marital adultery, but they are guilty of spiritual adultery. They have transferred Jesus being the first love of their life. They've transferred that love to something else. Spiritual adultery. Well, did you see it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Oh, listen. Demas was in love with the world. And listen, where our love is, there we finally are. When we have a wrong love, we live a wrong life. Yeah, you ever heard of the, uh, of the Bermuda Triangle? I don't know about all that over there. I, all I know is there, the Bermuda Triangle is over there. It's a triangle out in the, somewhere. And uh, the boats would, would go, go through there. And uh, the boats would go through there. And the planes would fly over. And when the planes would fly over, something would happen. They'd disappear. Gone. Or the boat would disappear, they said. Or this would disappear and that was, would disappear. And I remember when I was a kid, it was all about the Bermuda Triangle. I thought, man, there's something magic going on over there. There's three coordinates in Bermuda that make that triangle. I submit to you today, there are three coordinates in the devil's triangle. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now you listen to me. You get yourself hooked up in that triangle, and just like the boats disappear from the Bermuda Triangle, you will disappear from the work of God. Over and over, we've seen it happen. Friend, John Wesley said, the world is anything that cools my love for Jesus. Now I want to ask you this morning, what are you involved in that's cooling your love for Jesus? Or is your love still hot 
for Jesus. You see, we often think of backsliding as those living in gross sin. But friend, you can go to church, sing in the choir, give your money, do all of that kind of stuff, and still be backslidden. Listen, backsliders do not all go the same direction or in the same location, but they always go in the same direction. Backsliders do not all go to the same location, but they always go in the same direction away from Jesus. Yes, Demas loved the world. And listen to me now, and we're about done. He left the work. The word forsaken. Three Greek words mean to leave down in. It's a picture of leaving a man in a pit with no way out. He was a deserter. He left the work. Number two, he lost his witness. He went to Thessalonica, never to be heard from again. He lost his witness. He was like salt with no savor. And ladies and gentlemen, the greatest tragedy in all of Christendom is to look back over your life and declare it is a wasted life for the things of the Lord. The greatest argument for Christianity is a spirit-filled Christian. But the greatest argument against Christianity is a backslidden Christian. When Demas chose to love the world and desert his Lord, he shamed his Christ. He was saying, Jesus is not worth serving. Jesus is not worth following. Jesus is not worth my all. He shamed his Christ. He shunned his companion. He left Paul. He left the church. He deserted his calling. Listen, he committed treason against his king. Beloved, when you forsake your call, you forfeit your crown. In closing this morning, we see devotion we see decision, and we see desertion. I wonder, I wonder who Demas had started hanging out with. Now, he spent some time with Paul. He continued spending time with Paul. But you reckon he started hanging out with some other folk that did not share that conviction? Let me tell you something. You become and I don't care who you are, you become like the five people you spend the most time with. The Bible has a lot to say about who we run with. If you really study that out, the Bible has a lot to say. And whether you're a child, whether you're a teenager, or whether you're an adult, it does not matter. Maybe you're an adult and you run with five people that are the grappiest, grumpiest, sourest people in Hempstead County. Well, let me tell you something, friend. After a little while, you'll be the sixth one. I wonder who Demas had been hanging out with. But he was giving time to some other influences. I've always wondered who it was with Demas. Demas left. Listen, he went on to Thessalonica and this world got the best of him. Demas passed into the night. We will see and hear of him no more until his name is called at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, whoever thinks he stands, take heed lest you fall. Maybe you can't desert the Lord because you've never trusted him as your savior. But we encourage you to hear the gospel, how that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know Jesus? Will you trust him? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, send us a message, give us a call. We'd love to tell you how you can know for certain that you're prepared to meet God. Robert Robinson was his name. He was born in England over 200 years ago. He was saved under the preaching of the great George Whitfield. And then he felt the call to preach and he gave his life to full-time ministry. By the age of 25, he pastored a 
big influential church in Cambridge. And he was just bebopping along. Maybe the pride got to him, I don't know. Something else happened in his life and he suffered a relapse in his faith and he deserted the Lord for a life with the world. Years passed and he faded from the scene and few people in England even remembered who he was. Years later, Robinson was taking a trip on a stagecoach way back in the day. And he sat by a very interesting woman. And this woman had a book. <laughs> and oh, she was reading that book on the stagecoach. And, and, and old Robinson was sitting over there. And man, he could tell that lady was into that book. And she kept going back to a certain page. And she would read it and she would smile and all of that. And she held it up to Robinson and says, Good sir, have you ever seen this book? And he said, no, I don't, I don't know anything. I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. She asked him what he thought of it. And Robinson looked finally at the first few lines of a poem that she was reading. And the poem went like this. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Robinson read no further and he tried to divert the woman's attention to the beautiful countryside outside the stagecoach. But the woman kept asking, sir, what do you think of this song? And finally, overcome with emotion, Robinson burst into tears and he said, madam, I am the poor, unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand words to feel now what I felt then. Robinson went on to die at the age of 55, a victim of a lesser loyalty and the victim of a desertion of the God he once loved so passionately. What happened to Robinson and what happened to Demas can happen to any of us. There once was a time when Robinson and Demas were devoted and their loyalty had been decided. But somewhere along the way, something happened to dim their spiritual perception and they deserted the Lord. Demas, the deserter. Oh, friend, guard your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And I thank you for the powerful word of the living God. Father, help us to guard our hearts, to guard our steps, and to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Thank you for your word. Bless it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.